All right, good morning. If you're uh, staying for class, sit down. Sit down. <laughs> sit down and shut up, and I mean that in love. <clears throat> If you're not staying, get out. You need a runner? Um, I don't think I do today. I, I, I may at some point at the end. but um, So if you're wondering why we're always trying to pass the microphone around during class, it's because this is actually being broadcast. Um, you can't hear me? It's on. Can you hear me? OK. So um, the, if you're, the reason why we pass around the mic uh, during class is because we're actually broadcasting this. And so as, much, as loud as you may think your voice is, the mic, this mic doesn't pick you up. So um, that's why we're trying to run around as much as possible and, and, and hand it out today, or hand it out. Um, so if you say something and you don't have the mic, I'm probably going to repeat it. Um, that being said, um, Greg made the decision we're going to cover three chapters today. <laughs> and it made sense at first. We're studying Satan, and there are three chapters talking about Satan. I was like, yeah, no problem. And then this week I was like, I don't know how we're going to fit all this in. So forgive me if I talk really fast and I throw a lot at you. Hopefully at the end we'll have some time to have some discussion because uh, there's some, uh, some really... <sighs> cool is not the right word. Interesting. Uh, things that we're going to go through. So um, what we're going to be looking at is chapters 4, 5, and 6. Again, we're studying uh, using um, this book, Seeing the Unseen, as our guide, written by Joe Beam. Um, and so we are using that. So we're studying chapters 4, 5, and 6, which really are focusing on, on Satan. It kicks off section 2 of the book that is dealing with forces at work against us. And so what we're looking at is chapter 4, is there really a devil? Chapter 5, where does Satan come from and where is he now? And chapter 6, what power does Satan have? Now, I'm not going to follow specifically through those chapters. Um, there's a, I've got a little bit of a different flow to the lesson, um, but uh, most of it is, you, if you reference to the book, you'll see what I'm talking about. All right. Um, George Barna wrote a book uh, called What America Believes, and it was published in 1991. And there's some interesting data in that book. 47% of self-named evangelical Christians, 69% of Catholics, and 65% of mainline Protestants don't believe in a devil. Okay? This is not talking about the world at large. We're talking about Christianity. More than half don't believe that there's a devil, that there's a Satan. So what kind of advantage, what kind of leverage do you think that would give Satan if the majority of Christians don't believe in him? Now, what Beam writes is he says, it is true that our faith must be in God and our reliance on him, right? We talk about that very often. But Blindly facing the attacks of a real and vicious enemy, unarmed, is foolhardy, unnecessary, and extremely painful. So what he's basically talking about is if we're just taking the part where we say, yeah, God is with us, and we're leaving out the part that Satan is not, then we're just kind of running around, running into brick walls on a regular basis. We are told in the Bible that Satan does exist. 2 Corinthians chapter 2.11 Paul tells us that awareness of Satan's schemes keep him from outwitting us. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11 says, he says that putting on the full armor of God enables us to stand against the devil's schemes. So it's definitely talked about how we have somebody we need to stand against. How would you describe a person who believes in God, believes in the Bible, and yet doesn't believe and the reality of Satan. Now, Joe Beam describes them as spiritually naive and vulnerable. There's another thing that has to happen if you decide to write off the idea of a real devil. While we may be able to deny the reality of the devil, we can't deny the reality of evil. 
We see it around us. We see it everywhere. So if we deny the existence of de the devil, then we have to assign that power, that source of evil, to somebody else because it's coming from somewhere. So who are we going to assign it to? Now, in the, in the age of modernism, most believe that evil isn't a spiritual problem. It's a human problem. And so as such, correcting the problem calls for human solutions carried out by humans. So our human solution would be something along the lines of if we could just get people to treat each other with equality and respect, then all evil would disappear. Now, don't get me wrong, that is a fantastic concept, and I think the world would improve greatly if we would all abide by that. But I believe a quick survey of both history, and if you look at current events, you can tell that that's just not happening. Evil abounds, and the world isn't getting any better. And despite the best efforts of some truly amazing people in history, what seems to be the most consistent within humanity is both our selfishness and our willingness and ability to hurt each other. That seems to be the most common thing we can trace through history. We see it happen every day. So, can we begin to assume that something beyond our own human weakness might be at work here? Now, most of you are going to already agree with me on this, right? So most, most of you, this is not new information. But I still don't think we assign him enough power. And that's what we're going to be talking about. If we believe there is no devil, or if we don't assign him enough power, then we have to assume the battle of good and evil lives entirely within ourselves, and there is no one to blame but ourselves. On one hand, instinctively, we want to believe that we are not evil. We don't want to believe that evil emanates from us. We don't want to believe that we are the source of it. We want to believe that while sometimes we do evil things, that there is a cause that lives outside of us. So without a devil to blame, who can we place the blame on? Now, if humanity is to blame for the evil in our lives, then we have to specify who and how, right? You've got you to gotta assign it to somebody. Those who are often blamed are parents uh, or significant others, people in our lives who've been poor role models or abusers or even just too self-absorbed to give us what we need. We can blame leaders. We can blame politicians, preachers, elders, or anyone else in authority. We can assign them the blame. Perhaps our choices were forced on us by econo economic Political, governmental situations that are beyond our control, maybe they're to blame for everything that's going on. Then on the other hand, there are those who take on all the blame. So, low self-esteem, or seeing ourselves as completely without worth or value are commonplace in our society. S suicide is often the result of this thinking. There can be an assumption that we brought all of this on ourselves because we're so bad, because of our own deficiencies. We decide that our troubles are deserved punishment for what we've done and who we are. Everyone else seems to have it together, yet we are too weak, and so we continue to fail. So you see the overall problem is that if there's no devil, then the problem is either you or me. And that's really what it boils down to. Them, us, you, me, same thing. We have to assign it to someone. Now, Joe Beam presents that those who believe in the forces of evil beyond humanity are actually balanced people. And here's, what, here's what he says. He says, we believe that we are responsible for our own actions. James 1.14 says, but each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. So yes, we are certainly involved in our sin, and yes, we do make our own choices. But while accepting responsibility, we are aware that the temptations are not coming from within us, but are being placed before us. Understanding that distinction gives us the ability to go on in the face of trouble. It can change the way we operate 
on a daily basis. And that's really, I think, what this book is about, is changing the way we operate on a daily basis because how we're looking at things has changed. So I'm not happy when I sin, but I no longer buy into the lie that I am inherently evil. There is a powerful force that knows my weaknesses, that is trying to distract me from the knowledge that God made me in His image. They're trying to distract me from the knowledge that God has extended forgiveness to me through grace. The knowledge that I'm not my own worst enemy, listen to me on this, the knowledge that I'm not my own worst enemy frees me from overwhelming, unbearable, and unproductive guilt. Have you ever been driven by your own guilt? Now, on the other hand, knowing that, there is a, uh, knowing that other humans are not the enemy frees us from overwhelming, unproductive, and destructive hatred and bitterness. There have been times when hatred and bitterness for other people become driving factors in our lives. Knowing that there is a devil who seeks to deceive us and separate us from God begins to prepare us for a fight against the real enemy. Understanding the relationship of Satan to us is frightening, and we're going to be talking a lot about this for the rest of the time. Understanding the relationship of Satan to us is frightening, but it can also contribute to our peace because we stop fighting the wrong enemies. We stop worrying about fighting ourselves and other humans, and we start looking to the real source of power. All right, where did Satan come from and where is he now? So Joe starts off chapter 5 saying he wishes he could have seen Satan before the fall. Now, based on what Greg was talking about last week about angels, I don't agree. Pretty much when people see angels, they drop. Um, so I'm not sure that in all his splendor that I still want to see him. But what he's basically saying is that Satan was magnificent. Okay, now he starts out um, talking about Ezekiel chapter 28, and he, he takes this reference from a book called The Study of Angels by Dr. Edward Myers. Um, so he puts out there that Ezekiel 28 gives us information about Satan that we don't find anywhere else. So in this chapter, uh, Ezekiel is recording a prophecy, a prophecy about the king of Tyre. T-Y-R-E. We're not talking about an auto dealer. The king of Tyre. Um, but I am going to start a company called that. Um, anyway. The, uh, the author is drawn, sorry, if I don't amuse me, who's going to amuse me? Um, the author has drawn the conclusion that in describing the king of Tyre, the writer is making an analogy to Satan, and I, you'll see what he's talking about as we go through this. Um, it gives us a unique glimpse of what happened. So on page 44, I'm going to read from this, um, it talks about it. So, Ezekiel chapter 28 says, you were the model of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you, ruby, topaz, and emerald, chrysolite, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and beryl. Your settings and mountings were made of gold. On the day you were created, they were prepared. You were anointed as a guardian cherub, for so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God, you walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. Through your widespread trade, you were filled with violence and you sinned. So I drove you in disgrace from the mount of God and I expelled you, O guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth. I made a spectacle of you before kings. And again, that's Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 12 through 17. So what this is pointing out is that God appointed a spectacular being to be the guardian cherub of the Garden of Eden. This being was the absolute model of perfection from the day he was created, he was created, until the first sin was found in him. And his sin grew from his pride. Now, whether you accept that this is truly making an analogy between the king of Tyre and Satan, this does map very closely to the other things that we can find about Satan in the Bible. We do know 
that Satan's pride led to his fall. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 6 talks about appointing overseers for the church. And it says, He must not be a recent convert, or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. So if he was the guardian cherub of the Garden of Eden, let's also talk about the implications of that. That would imply that Adam and Eve were his responsibility. That he was entrusted with them, their well-being, their welfare. So that makes what he did even more frightening and hideous, doesn't it? So if he was entrusted with their care, that's really no different than us entrusting our kids to a daycare or a teacher or something like that, and they abuse them. And think about how horrible that is when you read about that thing. That may have happened to some of us. That's the same thing. It's the same analogy. Satan abused God's children that he was entrusted with. Now, we do know that his horrible deeds led to he and his angels being cast down from heaven. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment. Jude, chapter, or Jude 6 says, And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their proper dwelling, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. So, if we truly study Satan in the Bible, we are told that he is an awesome power. He's not a cartoon figure with a forked tail carrying around a pitchfork. He's not an animated character. He is an awesome power. Jude chapter 1 verse 9 says, But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not himself dare to condemn him for, sl uh, condemn him for slander, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Even the archangel Michael is going to be careful how he talks to Satan. Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 9 says, Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. It took a heavenly war to dislodge Satan from heaven. And he was not alone in that fight. He had other celestial beings, other celestial powers fighting with him. So the good news is he was defeated and thrown down from heaven, right? That's awesome. Okay. The bad news is where he is now. John chapter 12 Verse 31, verse, chapter 14, verse 30, chapter 16, verse 11, all refer to Satan as the prince of this world. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 calls him the God, small g, of this age. The Amplified Version calls him the God of this world. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2 calls him the ruler of the kingdom of the air. Kingdom of the air means that he's all around, right? So the heavens that the birds fly in, he's the ruler of that as well. 1 John chapter 5, verse 19 says, We know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. Frightening when you study what the Bible actually says about Satan. So if we are doing God's will or trying to do God's will, we have to assume that Satan is going to do his best to tear it and us apart. What he's going to try to do is confuse us adequately enough that we lose sight of God's purpose for us, become distracted, and then we begin to work for him. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to, to devour. He is constantly looking for prey and seeking those who can, he can destroy. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11 says, Anyone you forgive, I also forgive. And what I have forgiven, 
if there was anything to forgive. I have forgiven in the sight of Christ Jesus for your sake, in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. Satan is trying to outthink us, outmaneuver us, outwit us. Satan is planning our downfall, and he is scheming to find places for each of us to fail, including finding places for us to quarrel. Luke chapter 22, verse 31 says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Why? Because Satan saw these men as a danger, as a threat to him. Now, this is something we don't really have time to get into today, and I still need to do more study on it, but the idea that he asked for this to happen, I don't fully understand. Satan had to ask for the ability to do something. If you read the book of Job, you see the same thing, where Satan is actually having a conversation with God. I still need to spend more time studying that. If you've done some studying on that, I would love to hear <laughs> conclusions you came to, but I find that frightening as well. But basically, Satan asked to be able to do this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 18 says, for we wanted to come to you. Certainly I, Paul, did again and again, but Satan blocked our way. So Satan is actively working to wreck God's plans. He can't get to God, so how is he going to get to him? Through you and me. He's going to look for the weak point, and the weak point is our humanity. He can't hurt God, so he's going to try to hurt him through us. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie and all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse, 11, verse 14 says, Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising then if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. So he makes himself... And those things he put out there look very enticing, almost authentic. They look good. He looks good, and he makes those things look good. Matthew chapter 13, Jesus tells the parable of the weeds sowed among the wheat. So wheat is planted, but an enemy comes through and sows a bunch of weeds through that same field the wheat is planted. So, verse 37, the man who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. So, the seeds that Satan planted are among us. They're not somewhere else. They're all sown together. They have been planted among the good seed. So if we don't understand that Satan has awesome power, as well as intricate, elaborate plans for our downfall, then we are walking blindly into ambush after ambush after ambush. Have you ever felt that way? Where you're just kind of walking into things, and you're like, why do I keep ending up here? Why do I keep ending up here? And it's because if God has a plan for you, so does Satan. If we don't understand that Satan has awesome power, as well as intricate plans for our downfall, we are walking into ambush because he is studying us, and it's time we start studying him. And that's really what this series is about, is studying what we're running into. So if we don't know our enemy, if we don't study our enemy, how can we possibly be prepared for what he's going to throw at us? Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11 says, Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So the Bible tells us we have a host of celestial, spiritual powers at work against us every day. They're all around us. These are powers that we can't even possibly begin to comprehend with intricate plans to tear us down that we poss can't possibly unravel on our own. It also tells us that the only way 
We can stand against the devil's schemes is with armor that is not of our own making. It's not talking about making our own armor so that we can defend ourselves. It's talking about God's armor that is given to us. On our own, we are simply not equipped to deal with what is being thrown at us. So oddly enough, this knowledge comes with some relief. How, you ask? (laughs) As frightening as it is, this knowledge can give you some peace. A quote from Seeing the Unseen says, It puts everything in place. Now it makes sense. So many questions are answered. Now I can rest from the battle I have been having within, a vicious battle with myself. I can also rest from the battle I've been having with people who have brought pain into my life. Now I understand who the real enemy is. So let's talk about how he works. 1 Chronicles chapter 21, 1. Satan rose up against Israel and incited David to take a census. Pay attention to these words here. He incited David to take a, uh, take a census. Luke chapter 13, verse 16 talks about a woman who Satan kept bound for 18 years. Luke chapter 22, 31. Jesus tells Peter that Satan has asked to sift him like wheat. John chapter 13, verse 2, the devil prompted Judas to betray Jesus. John chapter 13, verse 27, after being prompted and choosing to follow through, Satan enters into Judas. Acts chapter 5, verse 3, Paul asks Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 4 says, The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. Ephesians chapter 2, 2 talks about the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. <coughs> Excuse me. 2 Timothy 2, verse 26 says, The devil has taken them captive to do his will. So some descriptors that run through here are in sight, bind, Sift, prompt, enter, fill, blind, work in, and take captive. So if you had any doubt, these passages leave no doubt that Satan has power to lead people to do wrong. Now, but most of these passages point to manipulation instead of out-and-out control. It also seems that for him to have control, we have to give it to him. So Satan can't make you do anything, but don't underestimate his power. So if he's been studying humans for millennia, he knows what makes us tick. And he knows how to exploit it. Think about what makes you angry. Think about what makes you feel despair. Think about what makes you lust or envy someone else, or be jealous of someone else? What makes you feel lonely? What makes you feel tired? What makes you feel defeated? These are the pressure points. This is what Satan's going to use. One of the things they talk about in recovery is, is halt. Something you need to be aware of is if you're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. These are points where you can see that I'm in a danger. I'm weak, being aware of those things. And that's kind of the basic idea of what we're talking about, is being aware of where these ambushes can come because you're aware of how Satan might be coming at you. I'll talk about me for a little bit. This week has been tough, and it really just hit me this morning as I'm running through the lesson again. How odd that the timing of that. I'm going to be teaching about Satan, and I'm having a rough week. And I'll tell you, okay, I'm not a cursing man. Hope, right? I'm a Christian. I shouldn't be cursing. But I'll tell you, I know a good sign that I'm in a bad spot is when it's in my head. I'm surrounded by it on a daily basis. I work in in the kind of world where it's just, you know, it's an adjective, a noun, a verb, 
the, it just, the, the words flow. And when it starts happening in my head, I now know I'm not in a good spot. So it may not make it to my mouth, but it's happening in my head. Anger follows. Despair follows, where I'm like, why am I even doing this? This is stupid. Ugh, you know, that's the things that I can start to look at in my own life where I'm now aware of what's happening. That only comes from experience of having walked into ambush and then relying on God to say, please show me what I'm doing. Uh, one of the things that um, I've had to go back and learn about myself, okay, you know the smallest kid in class, you know, when you were in, 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 in grade school? Okay, that was me, right? So, you know, you're looking around your friends and then there's David, right? That's me. Late bloomer doesn't even describe it, okay? So, the other thing is I'm very ADD, attention deficit disorder, okay? So, I have a real hard time focusing for any length of time, okay? Just sounds like stuff, right? This is just stuff the kids deal with. I had an enormous chip on my shoulder as I got older, something to prove. I really had to show that I was in control. And so whether it was physically or mentally, I really had this chip on my shoulder where I had to prove something. And that manifested in my career, where I would do just about anything to make sure I won. So there was a competitiveness that I brought to my career that came from this. And so I would manipulate, uh, I would run over people, and it worked. It worked in my career. I made advances that were significant because I did bad things. So Satan actually encouraged me in my sin by rewarding me for it. These are some of the examples that we need to talk about, about being aware of what it is that we bring to the table that Satan is going to use against us. So I'm now aware, so the first example I gave you, I'm now aware of those things that are the measure of when I'm not in a good place. I need to be aware of that so I know when it's time to drop to my knees, which is usually later than it should have been. <clears throat> First John chapter 4, verse 4. It says, You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one that's in the world. When we start realizing that we have God's power, we have God's armor, and then we need to start relying on that and stop relying on ourselves is when the game changes. So here's some conclusions we can draw. If we believe that the Bible is the Word of God, we have to believe that Satan is real. Satan's position and power are worthy of great respect. Even the angels respect his power. We should never be flippant when referring to him. Satan is here in this world and to a very large degree has control of it. But Satan is not God. If Satan is an angel, he's not omnipotent, he's not omniscient, and he's not omnipresent, which means he's not all-powerful, it means he doesn't know everything, and he can't be everywhere at once. His power is limited, especially when it comes to God's people. Now, the probability is, even though he's using forces to mislead us, he probably doesn't know who you are. So if you're limited and you want to affect the most people, where are you probably going to focus? People in positions of authority, leaders, people with the most influence, leaders of countries, peoples, and religions, maybe leaders of media. I'd pick the most powerful and influential people I could if I was limited and I need to change the world. However, Beam writes, before you breathe a sigh of relief that Satan's home may be far away from you, remember that Satan doesn't have to be everywhere at once. He has legions of angels, demons, and people who work for him. While Satan may not have personal knowledge of you, there is no doubt that one of his evil servants knows you intimately. And so his major tools are influence and confusion so that we give in to the influence. And it's also using us against each other, using us against ourselves, 
and then using us against God. One of the, uh, I read a book um, about Genghis Khan. I'm a serious history nerd. And I wrote, read a book about Genghis Khan and, and how he came to power and what he did. One of the things that was really interesting to me that was, I thought, a powerful analogy for the way Satan works is that when he would invade a place, it wasn't one and done. He had a multi-year strategy. So if you've read about Genghis Khan and the Mongols, you know that horses were their main mode of transportation. They were a huge part of the way they operated militarily. So what Genghis Khan would do first is he would come in and destroy all the farms. He would destroy anything that really was, was in the way of grassland. He would sow grass seed, and then he would come back the next year when his horses had plenty to eat. So think about that kind of patience and strategy, and then think about what Satan, who's so much smarter than that and has so much more time than that, might be doing and the layers he might be putting into place that are something that we have to deal with. This book is, when you read through most of the first part, it's very disheartening. And so as we go through this, I hope you don't leave here just going, it's, it's over, it's done. Because it does get to the point where we talk about what we have. And I hope we're trying to touch on this in every lesson that it's not just talking about the bad, we're also talking about what God has given us to stand against this. Even Satan can't beat God. And if we are gods, we belong to God, he can't beat us. Any questions or comments before we close? Back here. Jesus said, resist, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. So we have that. We're sealed with the power of the Holy Spirit. His power is greater than Satan's. But it's up to us to recognize what you were pointing out, how Satan uses the forces to uh, fight against us or to, to make us fall. But we have the power to resist mm -hmm. and, re and the responsibility to resist him. Mm -hmm. And then he'll flee from us. Right. Jack. What percentage do you say of Christians didn't believe that there was Satan? More than half. So the, it, it was different be... depending on the different uh, evangelical, Catholic, and mainline Protestant is what it said. But it was, it was well over half. But they can't be Christians, huh? I mean, because they're, they're picking and choosing what they believe out of the Bible. Yeah. And the Bible's God breathed, so every word is, is, came from God. Yep. So, I, I mean, self I, rest, I rest my case. So, self-proclaimed <laughs> is maybe the way we should say self-proclaimed Christians. Tom, back there. I'm having trouble fitting some of Joe Beam's sequencing together, and I thought maybe you could clarify. Uh, <laughs> One of the things he seemed to say, if I understood you correctly, was perhaps that Satan had been put in charge of Eden at the beginning. Yeah. And then uh, later, he is, Satan is kicked out of heaven and comes down and tempts man. Uh, how do you fit those two things together? And then there's one more thing. The war in heaven in Revelation 12 when you read of that war out of that chapter, it seems to occur either after the birth of Christ or after the beginning of the church. I understand there's some differences in interpretation of, of Revelation 12, as there is in all of Revelation, of course. But uh, the sequencing of that would mean that uh, Satan, the war in heaven happens after Satan is waiting to destroy the male child, which is apparently Christ, or some say the church. And so that's in the year uh, 2,000 years ago. And that's not far enough back to give us the origin of Satan. 
Am I making sense? Yeah, it makes sense. I, I, so I, there, those are my questions, yeah. and I'm sure you can fit all those together. I, absolutely. <laughs> so the world was created. Satan wasn't created with him, right? And in the beginning, God said it is good. So there was a time when it was good, right? And everything was fine. I think it's not till Genesis chapter 3 that the war begins. So the serpent, Satan, tempted Eve, and that seems to me when things turned, went awry. So you, I don't necessarily, I'm not necessarily saying that, that absolutely, you know, what Ezekiel is saying is about, is about Satan. I think it's something where you have to draw that conclusion, right? You have to infer it. Um, and so I don't, I think anytime you have to infer something, you should be very careful to say, you have to infer that, right? So I'm certainly not looking at that and saying, saying the fact, but we do know that Satan was created. We do know that in the beginning it was good, and then at some point it changed. We also, besides Revelation, can read several times about the angels being thrown out of heaven, right? So that had already happened, um, as it's talked about in the New Testament. So there was some sort of war that went on. And maybe that one we're talking about in Revelation is a different one, but the thing still, I believe, is documented as having happened at some point, that Satan was cast down, he's on the earth, that the angels were cast down, um, and it sounds like some of them are already locked up. Why Satan isn't locked up entirely, I don't know. Did that, was that uh, an adequate response, whether you agree or not? <clears throat> Anybody else? Heidi, just throw it. We've been talking about getting a giant mic boom that can... <laughs> the disbelief of Satan... Hold that close, hold it closer. The, the disbelief of Satan makes the whole point of Christ irrelevant. That's, I mean, he came to save yeah. the lost yeah. and for our sin. And so if you don't believe that there's evil, if you don't believe <laughs> there's Satan or the devil or sin, He's pointless. That's and a really, so that doesn't work for me at all. That's a really good way. And you, Jack, I think are saying the same thing, is, is that, what's the point? If you don't believe in Satan, then you don't need Jesus either. Yeah, yeah. Let's just do good things and be nice people. And how's that working? Anybody else? Bob. You had mentioned uh, Satan asking to uh, sift Job like wheat. And what that shows uh, is that, uh, and he also asked to have permission to, to sift Peter. Yeah. Uh, which shows that Satan just does not have the power to just take over our lives mm. and enter into our lives. Once we become children of God, as Joyce mentioned, we have that Holy Spirit living in us. And we are protected from that direct power of Satan. And the only way that Satan can reach us is by tempting us. And if we fall to that temptation, then he's got us. But if we continue to live by faith, trust in the power of God, he has no power over us. And as she mentioned, if we turn away from evil, he will flee from us. He'll go search for somebody else to try and control in life. But he has no direct power over us unless we give it to him by uh, succumbing to the temptations that are out there. Now that doesn't mean, and uh, in, in John 13, Jesus prayed that God would protect uh, his disciples with his power. And it was part of his prayer. And uh, we are under God's protection because we are his children. And he is not going to let Satan take over our lives. He's not going to let Satan enter into us. He's not going to let Satan uh, put thoughts into our mind that are going to drive us insane or anything like that. We are protected from him unless we give ourselves to him, as, as Judas did. 
and, and then Satan took over his life uh, completely. So just just a th yeah. Some so there. so um, certainly no disagreement there. Where I think we have to be careful is that we're not saying that he can't affect us at all, because you just have to look at the first century Christians to know how much he can affect us. He can use me to hurt you, because he's trying to hurt God. Yeah, he's saying we're not protected from the violence of the world, like third-party violence. So Satan can incite us against each other. Let me say one more thing. Uh, because Jesus was the only sinless person that ever walked the face of the earth, no matter how much we surround ourselves by God, Satan does impact us and he directs us yeah. to some extent. Yeah. The more you believe in God, the more you try to live a life that's the way God wants you to live, then the number of sins you commit through your life are less. But you still commit them because yeah. you, you can't, it, I mean, it's just almost impossible to stop. Yeah. Yeah, that, the, the, the being able to turn back after being tempted, after sinning, you know, the, that, that being able to get back up uh, over and over again, I think is the, is the thing that is what makes grace so powerful is it's not one and done. It, it's, it's, it never, never goes away. I believe there are degrees of intensity with Satan because it talks about in the Bible where a man cleanses his house and Satan goes out into arid places, comes back, finds the house all clean, and then he brings with him seven more demons far worse than they were in the first. And the Bible says he's worse off in the latter than he was in the first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the things I know uh, D D Steve Steele talks about a lot is he calls it white-knuckle Christianity um, where I'm just going to do my best, you know, do my best effort to be able to make it. And, and I think that's one of the things we have to make sure we're walking away from. It's not about white knuckle Christianity. It's about God's armor, not our armor. Not our, it's not our best effort because we're going to fail. There's no doubt about it. You're going to fail this week, if not just today, right? It's going to happen. It's what happens after that. We got kids standing out there looking in. Um, so, hope the study's helpful. Um, I will. I, I do want to say a quick prayer though, because I think it happened to me this week. Is that I realized that and it, Satan doesn't like when we talk about this stuff, and whether he's looking at me or not, that's that's a different. But but somebody's messing with me right now because we're teaching about this stuff, and so you guys are going to have to deal with that as well. So let's pray. Father in heaven, Satan tries to confuse us. Father, he tries to make us believe he doesn't exist. He just does anything he can to make us feel like we're on our own and like we're just left our own devices. So Father, as we're studying this, I know that he doesn't want that to happen. And I know he's going to send challenges. And I know that he's going to... Um, Try to stir the pot with what we're talking about. So Father, I ask for protection for each of the teachers as they're preparing, as they're delivering these lessons. I pray for an extra measure of protection on them. I pray that you will work through them and that their words will be your words, um, what you've given to them. And Father, I pray for an extra measure of protection on this church as we talk through this, as our eyes open, are open to some things, as we have realizations and I pray for an extra measure of protection that um, we are able to get a better idea of what we're dealing with and what results because of that. Thank you for your son, and thank you for that gift that just, uh, it, it is an unending gift of grace. We just keep turning back to you and turning back to you, and you just lift us up every time. Thank you for loving us that much. It's through your son's name I pray. Amen.